Welcome to Physics 142 Online. In our class on Wednesday, we finished right here with a discussion of the relationship between the period and the angular frequency for the harmonic oscillator. So the red box at the bottom shows the summary of that equation. And so just to remind you what's going on here, we've got a mass connected to a spring, and if we know the mass, m, and the spring constant, k, we can determine directly the angular frequency as well as the period of motion. And so going on from here, let's discuss just very briefly the meaning of the phase constant that's in the solution for the equation of motion, which is x as a function of t. So phi, the phase constant, is what connects the system's motion to its initial conditions. And initial conditions just means where the system is at time t equals zero and how fast it's moving. So we see, if we look at the equation for x as a function of t, remember it was a cosine omega t plus phi. So if we consider a couple of different possibilities for phi, we'll see how the waveform shifts, how the, uh, not really a waveform, but how the, the harmonic oscillator x versus t function shifts depending on the phase constant. If the phase constant is negative pi over 2, right, then we see actually what looks like a sine wave. And the reason for that is that a pure cosine function shifted by a phase constant of pi over 2 gives us a sine wave. At time t equals 0, if we plug in t equals 0, we see that the displacement is equal to a cosine of minus pi over 2, because the t equals 0 knocks the omega t term out, and so the displacement is 0 just as the graph shows. Now let's look at the simplest case, which is a phase constant of 0. And so then x would just be a cosine omega t, and at t equals 0, x at t equals 0, x would equal a cosine of 0, which is just a. And now we get the straightforward cosine function. This would mean that at t equals 0, the system is at its maximum displacement. And one more possibility, phi equals negative pi. And what that does is it turns the equation into something where the initial position, the initial displacement, is a cosine of minus pi, which is minus a. So in this case, the system would be at its maximum negative displacement from equilibrium. And these are simply three possible values of phi. We can have lots of intermediate values, and we'll probably see some of those in the homework problems. So moving on to discussion of velocity and acceleration, if we start with the position versus time function, the general case, a cosine omega t plus phi, if we simply differentiate that, we get the x component of the velocity. And so that gives dx dt, or minus omega a sine omega t plus phi. If we look at that expression, we can see that since the sine function oscillates back and forth between plus 1 and minus 1, the maximum possible velocity is simply what's out in front of the sine function, and that's the omega a. So this is simply a reminder of what velocity means. It's the slope of the x versus t graph, and therefore the maximum velocity is simply omega times a. And we sometimes will use that in homework problems. Moving on to the acceleration, all we have to do, starting with the velocity expression that we have above, is differentiate with respect to time once more. So dv dt is the acceleration in the x direction, and that introduces another factor of omega, and then the sine function becomes a cosine upon differentiation. So what this gives is an expression that once again allows us to see what the maximum acceleration is. The maximum acceleration will simply be everything that's out in front of the cosine function, minus omega squared a. So notice, too, that what we've done in differentiating twice is we've gotten back the minus omega squared term, and then what's left is simply what we started with, the x expression. So we can also write a sub x as minus omega squared times x. And this illustrates that when x is at its largest value, the acceleration will be at its largest value in the negative direction. In any case, the maximum acceleration is given here in the blue box. All right, so let's put the pieces together here and consider 
uh, the equilibrium position and then the maximum extension where the spring is elongated and then the maximum compression of the spring and compare the position, velocity, and acceleration values. So at equilibrium, uh, if, the, if the mass is oscillating back and forth, when it's at equilibrium, x is zero, but of course that means the speed is at its maximum value. And so depending on whether it's moving to the right or to the left, the v, the velocity, will be omega times a. Uh, and acceleration, since acceleration is related to x, uh, they're both zero at equilibrium. Remember, too, that acceleration is related to force through Newton's second law, F equals ma. So when the force is, or when, when the object is at equilibrium, the spring's not stretched at all, which means the force is zero. If the force is zero, the acceleration is zero. Then if we consider, for example, the maximum displacement, where x is equal to a, that's where the mass, just for an instant, stops before reversing its course. So the v goes to zero there. And it's also where the acceleration has its maximum negative value, its most negative value, because right there, it's, it was moving to the right, and it's beginning to turn around to go back to the left. So the acceleration is in the negative direction. Hopefully this is a useful uh, diagram to show the relationship between position, velocity, and acceleration. All right, now let's consider an example. A horizontal mass spring system, a spring connected to a block, with a given mass and a given spring constant, and we're told something about the initial condition here. Initially, the spring is compressed a distance three centimeters and then released from rest. Okay, here is the example problem that we're going to solve, and uh, it's fairly straightforward, but it's a great example of the kind of homework problem that you might have to solve as well. So, the first part asks us, with the given information, to find the period of oscillations. And what we need to remember is that the period is given by T is 2 pi over omega. And again, omega from our previous discussion of the harmonic oscillator problem is the square root of k over m. Here we're given k, we're given m, so the first thing we might want to do in part a is simply find omega. So omega square root of k over m, let's go ahead and plug those values in. We get 25 newtons per meter for k. m is 1 kilogram, and so the values have been conveniently chosen for us so that we end up with the square root of 25 or just 5. And when we convert those units, we'll see that the units are actually 1 over seconds, uh, which is appropriate for a frequency. But I'm going to write this just to remind me that I'm dealing with omega and not the frequency in hertz. I'm going to write this as 5 radians per second. All right, so that gives us the expression for omega. T, the period, is simply 2 pi over that. So T is 2 pi divided by 5 radians per second. The radian's not a real unit, but I include it when I do these calculations, again, to remind me that I'm dealing with omega and not f. So t, 2 pi over 5, gives a value of 1.26 seconds. All right, so that's part A. That was pretty straightforward. Now we want to find the amplitude and the phase constant for the oscillator. All right, we're given some more information here because we're told that the system is compressed a distance three centimeters and released from rest. And that's important. When it's released, that's time t equals zero. And so in this case, that's where it will have its maximum displacement. So we're also given the amplitude. Even though we're not told it's the amplitude, it's pretty clear from the description that that's the maximum displacement value. So that's three centimeters, and it's released from rest. So what does that mean? The v initial, or v at time t equals zero, is equal to zero. And that's really helpful. So we can immediately go to the equation for x of t. Remember that x of t is given by a times cosine of omega t plus phi. All right. And what we want to find out, we want to find 
a, which we've already written down, and now we want to find phi, the phase constant. How do we do this? Well, let's just plug in values for time at t equals 0 and write down what the position and then also what the velocity are. So I'll also write down the velocity expression that we already derived. And when you differentiate with respect to time, dx dt, just as a reminder of where this comes from, we pull out a factor of omega and also the cosine becomes sine with a negative sign. So there's the expression for the velocity. And what we need to do is plug in what we know. So x at time 0 is equal to, in this case, just a times, let's see, the cosine. Well, if time t equals 0, then all we're left with is the cosine of phi. And in this case, we know that that position, that displacement, x, is equal to a. Right? So that's actually... Uh, Let's see, the spring is compressed. Ah, right, the spring is compressed, which means that the position at that point is actually negative 3 centimeters. Because if it's ex ex expanded or elongated, then the displacement's positive. If it's compressed, the displacement's negative. All right, so that tells us right away that a cosine of phi is equal to negative 3. We know that a is equal to 3, right, 3 centimeters, so 3 centimeters cosine phi is equal to 3 centimeters, or actually negative 3 centimeters. So what we conclude is cosine of phi is equal to negative 1. All right, so the, the simple solution that we get from that, we would expect to be phi equals pi, because cosine of pi is negative 1. And in these kinds of expressions for the position and velocity, the phase constant is usually chosen to be a value, the smallest possible value, between 0 and 2 pi. So that seems to be the right answer for phi. But just to check, let's make sure that it works and gives us the proper initial velocity. So if we plug in in the velocity equation, time t equals 0, this then gives us minus a omega sine of phi, right, like that. We know that the initial velocity is 0. We were told it was at rest. So this gives minus 3 centimeters times the sine of phi. Well, we see right away if that has to be equal. Oh, I forgot the omega, but it doesn't matter because the omega is in there. But since the whole thing has to equal 0, and I know omega is not 0, then sine phi has to be 0. So sine of phi is equal to 0. And possible values for this would be phi equals 0, but also phi equals pi is another possible value. 2 pi would also work. We could have all of those higher multiples of pi as well. But the simplest, the smallest value that works is uh, phi equals 0 and pi. And we see that one of those, the phi equals pi, matches the answer that we got from plugging in the initial position. And so as a result, we can see right away that phi is equal to pi. So we've solved for phi. We also already know what a is, and that was just by initially inspecting the given information in the problem. And so the last step is to find the maximum speed and the maximum acceleration. And we can do that. I think there's enough room right here at the bottom to finish this off, because remember, Vmax if I go to the expression for v right over here, v max is just what's out in front of the sine function. And I'm not worried about the, the sine of it here, because we know it could be positive or negative. But v max is a omega. We know a, we know omega. So 3.0. Uh, let's see. I probably want to be careful about this and uh, do the units correctly. Uh, but that's okay. It, uh, the units, as long as I'm consistent, it'll be fine. So 3 centimeters, omega is 5 radians per second. And so we can see that we get 15.0 centimeters per second. That's the maximum velocity, the maximum speed, the maximum acceleration. I don't have the expression here on the screen, but from the previous PowerPoint slide, we know that this was a omega squared.
And so again, by plugging in the values, we're going to have the 3. We're going to have 25 in this case. And so we get 3 centimeters, 5 radians per second squared, which gives 75 centimeters per second squared. And of course, we could express those in meters if we wanted to. But that's enough for this problem and allows us to see a great example of how we can use the initial conditions uh, provided in a problem in order to uh, find exactly what the equation of motion is. So armed with this information now, we could take all of this together and write down that x of t is equal to 3 centimeters. Let's erase that. three centimeters times the cosine of omega t and then phi here plus pi like that and omega has the value five radians per second so that concludes the example oh, let's go back to some uh, new material dealing with the Sybil Harmonic Oscillator, and thus far we've been talking about the motion of it, uh, how x and v uh, depend on the time, but now let's look at the motion of the Sybil Harmonic Oscillator from the standpoint of energy. Uh, you remember from Physics 141 or your previous physics course that we can sometimes solve problems using uh, methods involving forces and accelerations, but then we can also use energy. Uh, to do it. So at time t, we see the expressions here for the position and for the velocity, and those are what we need in order to determine the kinetic and the potential energies. Kinetic energy, one half mv squared, so right away we can square the velocity term and express the kinetic energy as a function of time, and of course that's going to change because as the object's moving, it slows down, it speeds up, and so the kinetic energy goes from zero when it reaches the maximum displacement all the way to its maximum value when the mass returns to equilibrium. That's where it'll be moving the fastest. Potential energy, the only potential energy in the system is the potential energy of the spring. And that's one half kx squared. And so all we need to do is take the expression for position, x, and square it and plug in to the potential energy equation. And once again we can see that the potential energy is time dependent as well. Because as the spring stretches and then relaxes, the potential energy gets greater and smaller. By adding these two up, we'll see something really interesting about the simple harmonic oscillator. K plus U gives us the total energy, and if we take the two pieces that are given up here and add them together, we see that we get this one-half A squared. A squared is common to both terms. And then there's M omega squared sine squared of omega T plus phi plus k times the cosine squared of that same argument. And right here, we, we might be stuck a little bit until we remember the expression for omega squared. Omega squared is k over m. And if we take that expression and substitute into our equation for the total energy, we see k over m times m gives us just k out in front. And that's the same thing that's in front of the cosine term. And so the total energy becomes 1 half a squared m times k over m sine squared plus k cosine squared. The m's cancel. We pull a k out in front, and we get 1 half k a squared times the sine squared plus the cosine squared of this same argument. And remembering simple trigonometry, sine squared plus cosine squared is always 1. So the total energy equation that we get is very simple, and you'll note that the time dependence is gone. And so what's important about this is for the simple harmonic oscillator, at least in, if there's no friction involved, if we just assume that it's moving without any friction, maybe on a very smooth surface here, this horizontal mass spring system, the total energy stays fixed. And that's important. Energy of the simple harmonic oscillator is conserved. And we'll use that in some of the homework problems that we do. K and U change with time and position. But the total energy is constant. All right, uh, one more thing I want to talk about here just has to do with what's different about a vertical mass spring system. Everything that we've shown in the picture so far assumes 
that the mass is moving to the left and right horizontally across some smooth surface. So, of course, it's much easier to set up a vertical mass spring system. And here's a picture of the relaxed spring with no mass hanging on it. And as soon as you hang a mass on it, it's got to stretch. Uh, and so if we draw a free body diagram for that mass, when it's in the new equilibrium position, we've let it stretch, and now the mass is at rest, just hanging from the spring, we know that the spring force pulls upward, and the Earth's gravitational force on the mass pulls downward. In equilibrium, those two forces are equal to each other. And so spring force is equal to mg. If uh, the vertical direction is the y direction, that's the normal convention that we use, the upward force, k times y0, from Hooke's law uh, is equal to mg. And here, y0 is simply the amount that the spring stretched going from its relaxed position to this new equilibrium position. So we can solve for y0 and set it equal to mg over k. Knowing the spring constant and the mass, of course, the gravitational acceleration of the Earth, we know we can calculate this stretching distance. And what's nice about this is the only thing that changes when we have a vertical spring is the equilibrium position. So the spring actually is stretched a little bit to reach this new equilibrium position, but if I grab the mass and push it up and release it, it undergoes simple harmonic motion in exactly the same way that the horizontal mass spring system does. As I said, the only difference is there's a new equilibrium position. And so all of the mathematical apparatus that we've used will still work as long as we measure the distances, x, the displacement, away from this new equilibrium position. So that's the only complication for a vertical spring. We can still use the same equation, although now it's y as a function of t. Okay, and one more thing I'd like to preview then is the physics of the simple pendulum. The simple pendulum is one in which a mass that has basically all the mass of the system is connected through a very light string or rope to a pivot point. And what we're going to do, uh, in, normally in equilibrium, that mass would be hanging straight down, but we're going to grab it and swing it off to the side and release it. And as it swings back and forth, then we would like to know something about its motion and how does it oscillate back and forth. The simple pendulum means that the, the rope has essentially negligible mass and all of the mass of the system is concentrated in the pendulum bob at a single point. So those are the assumptions that we're going to make. The coordinate for this kind of motion, since the pendulum undergoes a circular arc, an arc that's part of a circular motion, is really polar coordinates. Uh, but they're kind of a simple polar coordinate because the mass always stays the same distance L away from the pivot point, away from the axis, and the only thing that changes is the angle theta. So theta is really what we will use to describe where the mass is located at any given point. And theta is related to its position along the arc through the familiar form s, where s is the position along the arc, equals l times theta. All right? So when this mass has been displaced a little bit and we look at it in the picture, we see that there are two forces. There's the tension in the string, and there's also the Earth's gravitational force, or the weight, straight down. So since we're wanting to apply Newton's second law, but we want to use it over the, uh, over the, uh, the, the appropriate coordinate system, we're going to define a coordinate system that shows the radial direction, and then that shows the tangential direction, or the direction along the arc. And that's the direction along this S that's shown here. So Newton's second law, F equals ma, gives us, uh, if we concentrate along that direction of motion, gives us just one force. And that force is a restoring force. And if I actually take the vector mg and break it down into its components, the component along the direction of motion right here is mg times the sine of theta. So mg sine theta with a minus sign in front because it's restoring the system toward theta equals zero, right, is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And since the displacement coordinate is s, we differentiate twice s with respect to t to get the acceleration. So 
minus mg sine theta is m d squared s dt squared. If we now substitute the relationship between s and theta, s equals l theta, well, if I take that expression and differentiate it twice, I get d squared s dt squared is equal to l d squared theta dt squared. That's a simple expression because l doesn't change with time. So just differentiating s with respect to t gives us this. Now we can substitute because the d squared s dt squared can be plugged in to the top equation. That gives us minus mg sine theta equals ml d squared theta dt squared. And look what happens. This is the really unique thing about the simple pendulum. The mass drops out. So it really doesn't matter what the mass of the pendulum bob is. We're going to get the same kind of motion. And so we get L d squared theta dt squared is minus g sine theta. And here is where we'll make the simplifying assumption that the oscillations of this pendulum are small. If that theta value is kept under about 10 degrees, then a really good approximation is to say that the sine of the angle is approximately equal to the angle itself in radians. So the angle has to be put into radians for this approximation to be correct. But it's a very good one for angles less than about 10 degrees. So for small oscillations, then, we take our equation that includes the second derivative of theta with respect to t, and instead of g sine theta on the right, we're just going to have g times theta. So solving for the second derivative, d squared theta dt squared, is minus g over l times theta. Right? And this looks suspiciously like the same formula that we used to describe the mass spring system. Only there we were looking at x instead of theta. Other than that, it's exactly the same kind of equation, and we had a different constant out in front of the variable on the right-hand side. But let's do the same thing here that we did before. Let's take that g over l term and define it to be omega squared. And if we do that, then d squared theta dt squared is minus omega squared theta, giving an easy way to compare the motion of the mass spring system on the left with this simple pendulum system on the right. And like, like I, I said before, everything's the same. x has simply been replaced with theta. So instead of having to go through our, our guess solution all over again, we can just write down the solution that we already know to be true for the mass spring system and simply solve it for the pendulum system. The only difference is we've got theta instead of x. So theta as a function of time is given by the equation in the blue box. And the period of oscillations, once again, t was 2 pi over omega. And so in this case, since omega is the square root of g over l, then the period is given by 2 pi square root of l over g, which makes really a very nice way of understanding this motion and seeing that it's closely related to the mass spring system. The mathematics turn out to be the same. Now, if, the, if we wanted to know how the system behaved for larger oscillations, then it would get more complicated. But if we're content to work with small oscillations around the equilibrium position, then we get exactly the same kind of solution.